Okay, uh, it's 9.30 and I'll call the Green Mountain Care Board's meeting of December 19th, 2022 to order. Um, today we have the Medicare benchmark proposal presentation by our staff, uh, Sarah Lindbergh, our Director of Health Systems Finances, and Lindsay Kill, our Data Analytics Information Chief here at the Care Board. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to the Executive Director, Ms. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few scheduling announcements. Um, first, as a reminder, we have a board meeting at 1 p.m. on Wednesday. And then later that day, we have our primary care advisory group meeting starting at 5 p.m. And um, in terms of public comments, we have uh, one ongoing public comment that um, is regarding the One Care Vermont FY23 budget. And um, as I said our board meeting uh, on this Wednesday, the 21st, the topic is uh, the One Care Vermont FY23 budget with a potential vote. We also have an ongoing uh, public comment regarding a next all payer model with our federal partners. Uh, please share any of those comments with us and we will share those with um, the Agency of Human Services and the governor's office as they are leading the next, uh, the negotiations on the next model. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Okay, we have the um, meeting minutes from last Wednesday, December 14th, um, 2022. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes from December 12th? I'm sorry, December 14th? So moved. Oh, second. And is there any board discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, and the vote unanimously carries. And um, we'll move to the next agenda item, which is Medicare benchmark proposal. And I'll turn it over to our staff, Ms. Lindbergh. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Lindbergh. I head the finance team here at the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, this is one of my older duties, so you won't hear a whole lot from me. Uh, instead, uh, Lindsay Kill will be our primary presenter, but I'm also here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lindsay Kill, and I'm one of the analysts on the data and analytical team here at the Green Mountain Care Board. I'm going to Pull up and share my slides. So today we are talking about the 2023 Medicare benchmark recommendation. Here's an overview of the agenda. We're going to start today by discussing the recommendation that we as staff are making. Then we're going to move into the background. We're gonna talk a little bit about the all-payer model and how the Medicare benchmark fits into our all-payer model. And then we're going to go over experience to date. We're going to talk about settlements over time, One Care Vermont results through 2021, prior year benchmarks and outcomes. So this year, our staff is recommending using the maximum allowable trend for One Care Vermont's Medicare benchmarks. There are two benchmarks, which we'll explain a little bit more about later, but there's 5.2% trend for non-ESRD, that's end-stage renal disease, and a 3.9% benchmark trend for ESRD. Um, our, estimate, our estimates suggest that these trends will allow Vermont to stay on track in, with its financial accountability targets and also accounts for Medicare reimbursement increases and will help bolster our fragile delivery system. So with our recommendation, here's just a high level view of the pros and the cons, and we're going to go into this more in detail. The pros. Vermont hospitals are financially fragile. This is a trend that we've observed nationally, um, and so we feel that this will help support them. The maximum trend will increase the amount of federal dollars available through the current all-payer model 
agreement, and we're going to show um, more detail on those numbers in a moment. And also, the maximum trend is estimated, again, estimated, to keep the state on track for its financial targets. And the only con that um, staff could really think of is that the maximum trend may endanger the ability of the state to fulfill its financial targets from the all-payer model agreement. But again, we're going to talk more about why um, we are confident that that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> um, so first, we have some comments that we just wanted to capture um, that we've heard on maximizing the Medicare benchmark. These comments most recently we've seen from the UVM Health Network budget narrative and also from One Care Vermont's budget narrative. And we have uh, citations to that here. Um, and what we want to point out is that um, over time uh, within this model from 2018 through 2022, the year uh, that we really that we did not maximize the trend, uh, um, the benchmark that was available was really 2022. So you can see in the third column, uh, trend limits to date, we have non-ESRD and ESRD. The non-ESRD trend was 10.4%. The ESRD trend was 7.6%. And the board voted um, on the same trend for both, 7.3%. In 2018 and 2019, the board did elect for the maximum allowable trends. And in 2020 and 2021, due to um, COVID-19, we actually used retrospective trends. So it's really just 2022. And what this slide is showing, I'm gonna break it down for everyone. Um, what this slide is really showing is the relationship between two really important um, components to the equation of money on the table for Vermont. One is the trend rate, and that is a GMCB decision. The trend rate I'm showing here on the x-axis, we have, we're comparing 3.5% and 5.2%. Again, we are not recommending a 3.5% trend. It's just for illustrative purposes, we are recommending the max trend, which for non-ESRD is 5.2%. That's what we're showing here. The y-axis is maximum potential savings in millions. The gray line is the advance on shared savings. This year, it's about 9.5 million. Um, and what we're comparing here is the difference between the GMCB decision, so the 3.5% trend and the 5.2% trend versus One Care Vermont's decision um, for their risk corridor. And so that is these two groups you see in the red, the 3% risk corridor and the 4% risk corridor. And we can see the difference between the trend, so 3.5% trend versus a 5.2% trend in both scenarios. And then we can see the difference overall between the two elected risk corridors. And the difference we're interested in is from the top of these bars in this bar chart to this advance line, because that difference is what would potentially be received at settlement. So why are we looking at the scenario between risk corridor and trend decision? And it's about leveraging federal funds. To date, the GMCB decisions, their votes on the trend, have added federal dollars for Vermont providers. You can see the benchmark decisions, um, advanced shared savings, um, that's 31 million. The imputed claims for 2020 experience for that 2021 benchmark, um, that's 457,000, and the floor in 2018, 196,000. 
So when we think about that 2022 um, trend that was set, the 7.3% versus the optional 10.4%, what we had chosen to do at that time was using actual, um, excuse me, we had chosen to use imputed claims for 2020's experience. Um, had we used actual experience and the maximum trend for the 2021 benchmark, that would have reduced ACO's benchmark by $14 million. At the time, they had elected a 2% risk corridor. So that would have reduced the settlement amount by 457,000. As illustrated on the previous slide, GMCB's trend decisions are constrained um, by the ACO's risk corridor. And we want to point out that the reduction in risk corridor has a larger impact on the opportunities for increasing federal dollars. That, again, was that difference between the top of the bar in the chart and that gray line. Just pop back there for a second. I'm a visual person. So again, the tops of these bars to this line are there's a larger difference here with a higher risk corridor. So um, the ACOs, for example, the ACOs gross savings in performance year 2021 were 22.3 million. With the 2% um, risk corridor as selected, um, the maximum savings were 10 million um, thereabouts, and the um, missed opportunity was $12.3 million. And then we show um, further down the chart, three, four, and 5% risk um, and how much money is uh, the difference there. So we're, we're calling that the missed opportunity. Um, the 25 million, had they elected a 5% risk corridor, 25 million would have been the savings and that would have been the maximum savings realized. For that year. So again, it is our recommendation this year that we um, uh, use the maximum allowable trend. That is 5.2% for non-ESRD and 3.9% for ESRD. The request, uh, we also request an advanced shared savings of $9,545,916 to fund the Blueprint for Health programs and SASH. So now I'm going to go into background and context that um, support those recommendations. So first, we want to talk about the all-pair model agreement and the many agreements and contracts that are kind of happening uh, within that umbrella. On the left-hand side, the we have the Vermont All-Payer ACO Model Agreement, or the agreement, which is, and that this is the one that I'll be referring to when I say the agreement throughout the rest of this presentation. So that is an agreement between CMS and the state of Vermont. And from state of Vermont, we have the GMCB, us, the Agency of Human Services, AHS, and our governor, who all signed that agreement. And then there is separately contracts with the ACO. Um, and within those, con those contracts are between payers, Medicare, Medicaid, commercial insurers, and providers, hospitals, independent providers, designated agencies. The agreement requires GMCB to set benchmarks for ACO's Medicare program. These benchmarks then have to be approved by CMS prior to the performance year. So I think it's helpful to remember how we measure the all-payer model. There are three areas of performance that we at the GMCB monitor and report on for our federal partners. The total cost of care or TCOC is one 
what I call yardstick. So is the financial yardstick by which we measure performance. There are many ways to measure financial performance. We use total cost of care. Scale or the proportion of the population in Vermont that's aligned to an ACO is the second yardstick. So that's just trying to think about, you know, how is the, the ACO network growing? And quality is our third yardstick, and that's really measuring the state's trajectory toward improving patients and providers outcomes. So we have financial performance, scale performance, and quality performance, all as part of our all-payer model. Where we are today, deciding on the Medicare benchmark trend is, sort of encouched in this financial yardstick. We want to look at um, this Medicare aligned uh, population because they're really our state's entry point to regulating healthcare for Medicare beneficiaries. And also, although the state has tried other mechanisms in the past, the Medicare benchmark is currently how we fund the Medicare piece of the Blueprint for Health and support and um, support services at home, SASH. And this is a um, pictorial <laughs> representation of what um, was on the previous slide. So underneath all pair, um, all pair model financial targets, we have these three areas. We have the all payer total cost of care per capita growth. That is 3.5% to 4.3% average um, from 2017 to the end of the agreement. The Medicare total cost of care per capita growth is separate from that, and um, Medicare is one of um, several payers in this model, so separate and but kind of underneath that. So we want the average from 2017 to the end of the agreement to be um, negative uh, 0.2 percentage points to plus one percentage points of the national projections. And we'll talk about those uh, national projections momentarily. So again, what we're talking about today is the GMCB's duty to set the ACO Medicare benchmarks. And those are annual growth targets for Medicare beneficiaries attributed to the ACO. The ACO's financial targets um, for these other payers, Medicaid and commercial payers, those are negotiated um, annually with the ACO. And the GMCB addresses those by using its ACO oversight to monitor how those targets relate to that all payer model total cost of care. Medicare relies on the GMCB to propose annual financial targets for the ACO on its behalf. So the agreement includes certain criteria the proposal must meet, and then, as mentioned before, CMMI approves or may request modification of the proposal. So here's what the benchmark looks like, um, at least part of it. So. Uh, the leftmost square, we have historical experience. We use estimated medical claim spending in the, the current year. So right now it's calendar year 2022 for beneficiaries who would have been attributed to the ACO in 2022 based on that 2023 ACO network. And we call that the benchmark reference population. Um, in our current agreement, we need to use the, the prior year to estimate the next year. And that's the way the, agree the agreement was written. And so obviously we're still in 2022. So we do use some estimating of that historical experience to round out that year. Um, we may think differently about that in future agreements because um, it has... Uh, it, it does make for yet another piece of this equation that has to be estimated, but that's what we do. The next piece um, 
this blue box here, the ACO aligned beneficiaries. This is the number of beneficiaries in the ACO um, or that the ACO will be accounted accountable for in 2023. And then this next piece, the percent trend, this is what our decision is at the GMCB. This is really the estimated change from the 2022 benchmark population to the 2023 actual population for ACO attributed beneficiaries. And when we multiply all those things together, we get a total dollar amount, which is the benchmark. Um, and that's the financial target for the ACO for Medicare. So per the agreement, the trend set by the GMCB must meet these certain criteria. The trend that is set must be at least 0.2 percentage points lower than the projected growth for Medicare fee-for-service nationally. So in April, um, around April of the preceding performance year, um, there's what's called the Medi Medicare Advantage call letter that is released. We use that number to then get our maximum allowable trend for consideration. So, for example, the 2023 trend for the non-ESRD fee-for-service Medicare expenditures was 5.4%. Therefore, Vermont's maximum allowable trend per the agreement could be 5.2%. Um, so we have the trend piece covered. I'm going to talk briefly about baseline experience, and we wanted to include this um, One Care Vermont comment that we received. This was in a letter to the GMCB on um, December 16th this year. Um, it says, we appreciate and support the GMCB staff recommendation to utilize the maximum allowable trend rate when computing the 2023 Medicare benchmark. However, we are very concerned with the calculation of the 2022 base spend. So that's that historical experience upon which that trend is applied and believe much more work and analysis should be undertaken to assure it's sufficient. We believe there are alternatives to ensure the base is accurately set to reflect actual, actual cost of care and would want to see that memorialized in writing. If the 2022 base spend numbers shared by the GMCB on December 16, 2022 are utilized, the 2023 target will be 0.1% higher than the 2022 target, which falls well short of the inflationary trends at a point when our network providers are facing extreme financial stress. Part of the value of the all-payer model agreement was to ensure adequate Medicare payments to Vermont providers. Undershooting on our Medicare target negates this benefit. So again, that is discussing the historical experience piece of the overall equation. So we wanted to share some more about the baseline experience. Each year, the GMCB reviews the baseline estimate and works with OneCare and CMMI to ensure it's accurate. Adjustments have been made in prior years. Um, the GMCB is coordinating a meeting between um, us and them to help identify the reasons uh, for the differences between CMMI and OneCare's estimates. And historically, One Care Vermont um, has overestimated the final per member per month. Um, that's the PMPM per member per month uh, at this time of year. So in performance year 2021, the uh, One Care Vermont estimate was $838 to $858. And the actual um, ended up being $821, uh, again, per member per month. And in 2022, the estimate is $867 per member per month from One Care Vermont, and CMMI's current estimate is around $820 per member per month. And um, the 2023 uh, benchmark estimate is $829 per member per month. So 
while the targets between 2022 and 2023 are close, that is largely due to the trend rate. The baseline um, experience estimate between these years actually increased by 2.5%, which is what the table below is showing. CMMI's most recent estimate for performance year 2022 experience is eight, around $820 per member per month which would result in one care maximizing their potential savings. So we see the difference between the baselines is 2.5%. The trend, um, it's actually a negative 2% 2, 2 difference and the target is uh, differs by about 0.5%. So jumping back into our discussion about the different trends that we set, um, we do set two for one for end-stage renal disease and one for non-end-stage um, renal disease patients. So we set them um, separately in order to mitigate risk. Um, there are very few beneficiaries eligible due to ESRD. Um, however, their average expenditures are much, much higher than the remaining population. So by setting two different trends, we're able to um, see that um, bear out and again, mitigate the risk that were the final impact to the, the benchmark. Um, we also wanted to address what is a common point of confusion with the benchmark and the AIPBP. So Medicare offers prospective payments, and those are called all-inclusive population-based payments, or the AIPBP. It's a very fun acronym to say fast. <laughs> um, these payments are designed as a cash flow mechanism to provide more stability to providers during the year. Ultimately, the AIPBP is reconciled to the um, would have been paid amount, and that's on behalf of the those attributed beneficiaries. So when we think about the total Medicare AC, the Medicare ACO total cost of care, it's a sum of those traditional fee for service payments and the AIPBP claims. That AIPBP amount is calculated separately and reconciled independently from this benchmark. So for example, in 2019, we have an AIPBP of um, $0, a little asterisk there about, um, there was a hospital that signed up but was not eligible. Um, and that represented around 12.2 um, million. It was identified early, one care held on to the funds, but. That's why it looks like zero dollars there. In uh, 2020, um, it was um, a negative 36 million. In 2021, negative 7 million. So that's the adjustment. Um, the full settlement amount related to the benchmark was 11 million in 2019, 16 million in 2020, 10 million in 2021. And the settlement, the final settlement, minus that advance um, from the advanced shared savings was around 5 million in 2019, 8 million in 2020, and 1 million in 2021. Um, the AIPBP was disrupted in 2020 due to the pandemic, um, but has been relatively close since. Again, this AIPBP reconciliation is separate from the benchmark settlement. So we want to think AIPBP is cash flow and benchmark is performance. We also wanted to talk about the advanced shared savings. Medicare's investments in the Blueprint for Health programs ended in uh, 2016, and those programs are the um, PCMH program, community health teams, and um, SASH, support services at home. So the agreement included provisions to allow for the continued funding of these Blueprint for Health programs by Medicare, and that funding is attached to the Medicare benchmark, 
but does not represent performance risk. The advance that's provided with the benchmark is reconciled at settlement. So that's that amount that's always subtracted from the total settlement. Um, again, just looking at the performance year with the approved benchmark trend and the trend limits to date, and some notes on each of those benchmark decisions. So experience to date. On this page, we are talk we wanted to show the difference between the prospectively aligned population and the population included for settlement over time. So the uh, Vermont Medicare ACO program limits which beneficiaries are included in the in the final financial settlement. In order to be included, you must maintain eligibility for the entire performance year or up until um, you pass away or receive 50% or more of your primary care services in the ACO's service area. So what we're seeing here, where in the beginning of the model, 2018, there wasn't um, a ton of beneficiaries who were prospectively aligned and then not included for settlement. And over time, that difference is getting larger. We're seeing more beneficiaries drop out of the prospectively aligned population to those who are ultimately included at the time of settlement. And that is due to more Vermonters opting for Medicare Advantage plans. So they opt for these plans at some point during the year, and then they're losing their um, eligibility for um, to be in the model. Here we're looking at um, the experience to date with those settlements. Um, what we really want to highlight here, um, I'm, I'll go through all the rows and then I'll talk about the high, the talking points. Um, we have gross savings and losses, the cap on the savings and losses. So that's considering the ACO's elected risk corridor. What would that maximum be? The capped savings or losses, so how much was earned, any quality adjustment where there was one, the ACO, the, the ACO risk arrangement, so within their risk corridor, they have a percent of that risk corridor that they would take on uh, risk. We have the adjusted capped savings and losses, um, and these numbers, there's an asterisk here because these, um, this here also includes a deduction for sequestration, which is part of our agreement. And the advanced shared savings amount. So this row here is the amount of money that was provided um, in advance for funding those blueprint programs. And then you can see the adjusted capped savings and losses minus the advanced shared savings. That's what we mean by um, it's attached to the benchmark, but is not a part of performance risk. It's just subtracted off at the end. We get these net settlement, uh, net settlement adjusted for advanced shared savings. So this bottom row here in bold. So the takeaway from this slide is that over the last four years of the all payer model, Vermont providers have received $31.1 million and the ACO has netted $20 million. And our concern as staff is that future models may not be as beneficial for Vermont. On this slide, we're looking at the financial target compared to the ACO's expenditures and the difference between the two. So this is the result of the risk arrangement um, at a very high level. And we, what we're trying to illustrate here with this slide is how close it's been um, over time, which is a good thing. That means that the um, estimates are um, accurate and the benchmark is appropriate. So we see the fee-for-service amount 
plus the AIPBP amount is that total Medicare ACO total cost of care. In um, 2021, the financial target was 492 million. The ACO expenditures in total were 479 million, and that difference was 13.5 million. Here's a uh, picture representation, again, of just thinking about the Medicare benchmark, performance risk, historical experience, times the number of beneficiaries, times the trend, and then the advanced shared savings that gets tacked on the end there. And that's the addition of funds for those programs. And the sum of them is the total benchmark. So we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, a pro to maximizing the trend, we believe is that it's um, in alignment with our agreement with uh, CM CMMI and also is not threatening our total cost of care per member per month goals for this model. And so that is what we are trying to illustrate here. We have actuals uh, per member per month. This is the all payer model PMPM. So this is everyone folded in Medicaid, Medicare and commercial payers. So we see the dip in 2020. And we have um, really good estimates for 2021 as that data is nearly complete. Um, and we see the corridor here, um, the low end being uh, the low end of our prediction being um, $569 per member per month in 2021 and 2022, $585 per member per month. And on the high end, $592 in 2021 and $599 in 2022. And those are all still well below um, the total target, which is $612 to $641 per member per month. So again, it is our recommendation to use this maximum allowable trend for One Care Vermont. Medicare benchmarks 5.2% for a non ESRD and 3.9% for ESRD. And we are requesting an advanced shared savings of $9,545,916 to fund the Blueprint for Health programs and SASH. Great, thank you very much, Ms. Kill. Um, I appreciate that. Um, at this time, I'll turn it over to uh, board members for any questions or comment. Um, does anyone have any? Please just go ahead. I can go ahead and jump in first if that works for folks. Please. Um, thank you, Lindsay, and thank you, Sarah. Um, the Medicare ACO program is not simple, so I appreciate that you really walked us through it again um this year so um i just want to make i just want to confirm some understanding to make sure that um i'm thinking about this the right way would you mind pulling the slides back up so we could look at the visuals thank you um so if we go to slide um it's either six or seven. I think it let's look at seven, I think. Yeah. So. My takeaway from slide six through uh, eight or nine is that. Basically, our decision about the trend rate. Um, has between a three hundred thousand to well, pretty much a $300,000 impact versus the decision about the risk quarter has closer to a $5 million impact. Am I, is my math correct? I see you said, shaking your head, yes. Um, and so if we go back to the six with the 2022, um, we had quite a discussion, is my recollection, about whether or not to go with the max versus uh, a slightly reduced trend um, 
last year. And um, my recollection of the why here was that um, I recall looking at data that reflected Vermont's experience versus national experience to uh, kind of look at how our experience compared to this trend rate, which was based on natural, uh, national experience. Is that, Sarah, can you, I know you did the presentation last year, but can am I remembering that right? Yeah, yeah, and it was a, a bit of an either or proposition. We could either adjust the base experience to try to address COVID or use the maximum trend. Um, and so it turned out to be much more beneficial to kind of impute or use a counterfactual for 2020 um, than maximizing the trend on actuals. Um, so that was uh, given that we right, you know, tried to address the COVID dip uh, in the base experience. Uh, we picked a growth rate that we thought was um, appropriate based on, uh, you know, part B and part A premium growth, um, which appears to be pretty, pretty on target for this year. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you for refreshing my recollection there because that I remembered part of it, but not the whole story. So I appreciate uh, that uh, you refreshing for me. Um, can we go to slide 15, please. So um, thank you, Lindsay, for, for going through the calculations again. And so the one piece that I wanted to just confirm from my prior memories around this is that the while well, we, we have these two different targets, but of course they interact, right? Because when we're calculating the all pair total cost of care per capita growth, the Medicare experience is included in that. So the choice that we make on the uh, related to the Medicare total cost of care also has an impact on the total cost of care per capita. Am I remembering that right? That's correct. Yes. Okay, yep. <laughs> thanks. Um, and so, and we're bound to both of these uh, components of the agreement in the state of Vermont in terms of targets, although there's quite frankly not the risk of blowing the targets is really a corrective action plan. Is that? Am I, yeah, yeah. Is that the right? other thing that happens is um, if we uh, have a, a an event that triggers uh, CMS to intervene, they would take over setting the benchmark from the state of Vermont. So that's one consequence if we don't meet our uh, target. Thank you. Yeah, it's just good to remember kind of what, you know, how these things all interact. Um, okay, and then I did want to talk a little bit about the letter that uh, we received from OneCare and that you've alluded to and quoted from in the um, in the presentation. And so, um, I think starting with the benchmark, um, first of all, we don't decide the benchmark. That is something that CMS has retained authority to decide, right? Yeah, we propose a benchmark for CMMI to approve, um, but we are um, at their uh, mercy uh, to set the historical experience due to Claims thank leg you. and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. I I misspoke. I meant the base experience component, but thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. So the in terms of the base experience, CMS does that part. Our role is to, to decide the trend. Yeah, and we do certainly work to make sure that the base experience is um, is correct, and you know it hasn't always been accurate. So we we have a role to play there. <clears throat> Great. So it sounds like in terms of the benchmark experience concern that One Care raised in their letter, that's um, you're working to to get CMMI and One Care together to continue that conversation. Um, that's not a decided component yet or so it sounds like there's still conversations happening yeah we're working to get a meeting on the books this week uh to figure out why we're not uh tying out <clears throat> okay great and just has that happened in the past that sort of a meeting uh we have had those in the past yes okay. great and have we successfully figured out the mathematical glitches 
Um, I would say that that in my experience, what is this year five? Uh, pretty much most years uh, we go in with one care thinking it's not high enough and CMMI thinking it's too high. Um, and that's pretty standard this time of year. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, in terms of the um, other component of the letter, which is related to uh, the blueprint and SASH dollars. So um, this, has also been, I think, an area of confusion in the past with uh, the hospitals feeling like they're getting delegated risk um, for blueprint components. Um, and so I think, you know, from my way I've always thought about this, we're adding the money in at the beginning so that they can get the cash, which I believe comes quarterly, am I remembering that right? Yes. That's correct. Um, and so that brings these additional federal dollars into the state, but then because we've added it on top of the benchmark, we pull it out of the benchmark so that the assessment around settlement is really on the performance risk, which is um, the other components of, and maybe it would make sense to go to that slide that you made, Lindsay, that has the different components of the benchmark. Uh, and I don't know if that's an overly simplistic way of thinking about it, but that's how I've always kind of thought about it is we're adding it in, we're taking it out, what their their shared savings is then based on the performance risk. And so if we didn't have this in the benchmark, um, they'd still be assessed on their performance risk. Correct. Um, so I, I guess I'm... I'll just make a comment, which is I'm a little confused about why um, One Care is so concerned about the blueprint and sash component, because to me, it seems like it adds clarifications to the risk bearing entities, which are the hospitals for primarily, although we do know there's some risk on primary care providers and would sort of clarify what they're actually working towards in terms of uh, a benchmark. Um, and this isn't really a question for you. <laughs> uh, it's more a comment is I had been hoping when there was a in the public comments some concern expressed about this, that we would get some sort of analysis that explained the concern. Um, and I feel like the letter that we received more asserted a concern without really providing me with enough facts to understand the basis for the concern. So what I'm hoping for is that before Wednesday, uh, there might be some additional clarification from OneCare about the facts. For example, if there's some audit concern or some other accounting concern that has not been expressed, that would be helpful information to understand. Um, and the other piece that I'll just say out loud is that we know from the hospital budget process that many, although not all hospitals, don't necessarily reserve for the delegated risk. They sort of assume since it's up and downside that over time, they're just gonna break even. Um, and so I, I'm just putting that out there because I think it's, it. this is sort of a different, one care is looking at it in a different way that I'm used to hearing hospitals talking about it as the risk bearing entity. And so I think some additional explanation would be helpful, including any analysis or facts that support the concern. Um, because my understanding is the money will still be paid quarterly under the staff recommendation and that the this component would be just like it is today, part of the settlement, which would for 2023 would incur would happen in 20 mid 2024, I believe. Um, is that right? Usually around the fall. Yeah. Okay. So um, so the financial issue would hit in the fall of 2024, potentially, and that the if there is one based on the performance, um the, the risk would still be delegated to hospitals for the performance components. Um, and so it seems to me, like I'm just, I'm 
not understanding the cash flow issue that they raised because I don't see where where that comes into play in 2023. I suppose there could potentially, if things really are much different than they've historically been, be an issue that hit in 2024. Um, but the way that One Care's administrative budget is typically funded is through hospital dues. And so it seems like there's a number of issues that could be considered in 2024 if things really go south. So maybe I'm not understanding the concern, um, but that's how I've been thinking about how this works. So if I'm wrong, I would love to understand that better. And that's really more a comment for One Care, I think, than you guys, although obviously you can respond if you want to. Yeah, I think that, you know, the the pressure is that, um, you know, another another way to think about this is if they don't save nine point five million that they would have to pay that back. Um, and so that is, in fact, added on here. Um, but if they even don't meet the target by one dollar, um, they have to start paying it back. So. Right. So the the mechanisms I think that we had talked about before, should that come into play in the fall of 2024, is that there are some reserves. So there's $3.9 million of reserves that the board had uh, required. There's the 10 million line of credit to which could be accessed and guarded against any cash flow issues. Um, obviously, then paying back the line of credit would have to be considered um, if it was greater than 3.9 million. But I think for what I had been thinking was that um, clarifying the delegation of actual risk to the hospital network made sense, given, quite frankly, the issues that they've raised with us about it. Um, and that if things it seems to me quite unlikely that it would, given the past his, historical experience, that as long as the Medicare benchmark stuff is sorted out in an appropriate way so that the benchmark is appropriately set, that it was an unlikely occurrence that uh, the the losses would go beyond, you know, certainly beyond the 3.9 million that we ordered. And that if there was something really extraordinary that happened, like that's certainly something that they could come in at that time and talk about, and we could discuss how to remedy. So that's how I've been thinking about it. So I just wanted to put that out there. If there's, you know, corrections or a misunderstanding, love to hear it. Um, I would love to hear it with data and analysis from OneCare. If they should like, you know, it's up to them whether they provide that or not. So. Uh, sorry for taking up so much time, but I was just trying to clarify all these issues um, in my own head. So thank you to my fellow board members for your indulgence. Um, so um, Thomas Boris has his hand up, but we'll go through and finish the board questions and comments in the HCA. And then um, Mr. Boris, just hold your thought. And if you have others that come out of this, we can um, you can add them. So I'll call on you once we're done with the board member questions, OK? Um, but thank you. Um, any other board member questions or comments at this time? Could I uh, ask a clarifying question? Uh, Lindsay, would you be able to walk through slide eight again for me and just explain what these numbers represent? Yeah, um, so um, I can take a shot. Um, Sarah, do you do you maybe want to jump in as well, or do you want me to go ahead and? Sure, I'm happy to. Okay. So um, over the years, uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback that the board is failing to maximize the trend on the benchmark. So um, I'm just that uh, th this is an attempt to lay out how board decisions have tried to leverage federal dollars to their maximum extent. And so one is the advance, which um, <laughs> truth be told was only um, encoded in the agreement for 2017, but we've been able to um, negotiate to keep those dollars flowing uh, since. 
Uh, also, uh, again, we are the ones uh, that worked with with uh, CMMI to um, impute the experience for 2020 um, instead of using the actual claims uh, for 2020. And so that ended up adding um, an extra half a million to the settlement that went to one care. Um, and then in uh, the first year, 2018, uh, due to where the national projections landed, we had the ability to use the floor, which added a percentage point to the trend. And again, because it's constrained on the risk corridor, that added you know just hundred thousand um, dollars to the settlement that eventually went to the ACO. So okay, we're really so trying to say two aggregates. things. One is that you know the board, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. What yeah. So these, you know, yeah, I was going to say so. So two things. One, that I don't think that we've really undermined uh, undermined uh, any of the potentials. The risk corridor is just a much more powerful way to leverage federal funds than the the trend decision when it comes to you know checks actually being sent to Vermont providers. Thank you. And then on slide twenty nine. I'm just trying to figure out how to think about this net settlement adjusted for advanced shared savings line. So um, if we do the adjusted capped savings slash losses, the third from the bottom line, that is the savings that we, through the all payer model slash one care, as a state have received um, annually on Medicare patients adjusted, ad attributed to the model, correct? Yep, that's the actual financial segment, yep. <clears throat> okay, and then the advanced shared savings money is ne negotiated with CMMI, but is an advance on potential savings. Yep. That's why it's reconciled at settlement. Yep. So if you were to remove the advanced shared savings, um, would would one care have actually been able to receive more adjusted cap savings in a year like last year? Because it's uh, not part yep. of the risk. Right. Um, the only yeah, the, there's a minor mathematical. So because we're adding, you know, nine million, the corridor increases by you know whatever percentage so if it's a two percent corridor they that adds whatever two percent of nine million is a little so yeah they would get the savings <laughs> but uh yeah but the blueprint would not be funded okay so it's not like if they held the risk for the advanced shared savings that then last year they could have potentially gotten 18.7 million. They would still get 10 million in that line. Yep. It wouldn't be additive of those two. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And then the last line is essentially um okay, what it is, the difference between the two above it. Got it. Yep. So when I'm thinking of yep, I'll, I'll leave this for uh Wednesday's hearing then. Thank you. I, I Robin, no I really problem. actually appreciate your comments and talking through um, how you understand that was quite helpful to me. So thanks. That's all for now. Actually, just a quick question while this slide is up. That second line, the cap on savings and losses, that's determined by the ACO's decision about the risk corridor, right? Correct. And everything flows down from there. So that number could be quite a bit higher if they would choose a wider risk corridor. And then it would flow all the way down the spreadsheet to the bottom and be a much larger number. Yes. Correct. Okay. Um, and one more question. Um, could you just put up slide 20 for a second? Um, I just want to, do we know what uh, One Care Vermont's estimate for 2023 is? No. Um, and that, it's not as easy for them to predict because um, they have a new organization uh, in St. Jay 
participating and they don't get to see those claims until they sign the participation agreement. So, um, so they're probably going to guess that it's not a lot of lives, but um, they might might be a little bit more expensive. We also have the ongoing uh, Medicare Advantage penetration rate. So, um, yeah, they, I, my guess is they would think it'd be a little bit above the 867 they're predicting for 2022. Okay. Um, and the other question I had is uh, when it says CMMI and it says, so say, for example, 821, and that's actual, is that uh, was that 821 also what seemed, I guess I'm trying to understand what did One Care Vermont estimate at the, at this time, this, you know, in 2021 for performance year 2021, what did CMMI estimate at this time? And then what was the actual? That second column, that CMMI, is that what they estimated or is that what the actual wound up being? That is what the actual <clears throat> wind it up being. Um, I can check my notes about, uh, what they were predicting. Um, well, they okay. wouldn't, they they would be predicting that. Yeah, I, I can I can go look that up. Okay, I'm just trying to understand that, you know, I understand there's a discrepancy this time of year. Oh, yeah, they um, didn't for 21 because it was retro. That's why they didn't. Oh, that's right. <laughs> we knew we it just... was going to be retro. Yeah, that's why. Okay, that makes sense to me. Thank you. Okay. Um, Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate all of this. And I also just want to reiterate the point earlier, I think, that Robin made that we don't actually set the baseline experience. I recognize that we have to do a, a so to speak, a sniff test on that. But the reality is that we don't set the baseline. That is done by CMMI and their consultants. Um, what we actually have uh, mm -hmm. leverage and decision over is the trend rate. And, and you're proposing the maximum trend rate this year. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a, a quick uh, couple comments and like, um, well, thank you, Robin, for helping uh, deepen my understanding. And thank you, Lindsay and Sarah. Um, th this has been very helpful. Um, this is my first go around with uh, ACO review as part of the board. Um, this is uh, the most complicated ACO agreement that I've come across. Um, having experienced a handful of different parts of the country. What I can, um, what I want to share to check my thinking, um, in other conversations with other organizations, when we have thought about maximizing our the federal dollars that fl would flow to the organization, the uh, how wide we set the risk corridor, I have come to see as a bet on our, meaning an ACO, a bet on ourselves, that if we are sure we can meet the quality standards and we are sure that we can meet um, the dollar amount, the higher, the wider our corridor, the more money we can earn. So it's basically a bet whether we can perform or not. Because if we set a wider corridor, we get more money in return. And so the past couple of months learning about these things here with this particular ACO um, has caused some self-doubt some for me because they're not looking at it that way or at least that I can tell. Um, it appears they either don't believe they can achieve their goals or they don't understand how to maximize the return for federal, federal dollars. Either is concerning. So if I'm wrong about that, I'm happy to have anybody tell me um, but that's how I've come to understand how ACOs work. So with that, I'll turn it back to the chair or whoever wants to go next. Um, thank you. And um, I told Mr. Boris um, to hold a second. So I'll just do HCA, um, Mr. Boris, and then I'll turn to you and then we'll go to public comment. Oh, um, does... Before we do that, could I just jump in? 
for Please. one minute. Um, yeah, so, Tom, I would say the third possibility is that they have a risk averse provider network that is not confident taking on the risk. Thank you, Robin. Okay, um, great. Healthcare advocate, do you have any questions or comments? Thank you. Just a brief comment. Um, um, first off, appreciate this is complicated stuff, and I appreciate the board for its work and its presentation. I thought it was presented uh, carefully and well this morning that, um, that uh, made it easier to follow along. Uh, I also want to appreciate Ro uh, board member Lunge's question at the beginning. We landed at very much the same place in our discussions this morning. Um, what is it that one care is pushing back on? And if they have data to provide, um, why have we, you know, we'd be interested in seeing it. Um, beyond the answers to those questions, of course, we're interested in the answer to those questions. But beyond that, um, just a clear statement that the HCA supports the board staff recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. Um, Mr. Boris, if you'd still like to um, speak, the floor is yours, and then I'll turn to public comment if, if you'd still have um, something to contribute. Thank you. I'd love to say a few things. Uh, sorry for raising my hand at the inappropriate moment. No, no, um, you're fine. Please, 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 thank sorry. you. I'm sorry to cut you off. I just want to set it out, but go ahead. No problem at all. All right. Hey, everyone. Um, so a couple different points I'd just like to make throughout the presentation. Um, uh, Chairperson Lunge, what you said was exactly right. If I anal analyze a target, and even I feel like it's a very sufficient target or one that we can beat, we are up against the risk tolerance of providers out there in Vermont. They make these decisions relative to their own financial health, their own balance sheets. And often what I hear is uh, if we have a rough year, we essentially lose our margin for that particular performance year. And with a number of critical access hospitals in the network, I think that's a tough position to put them in. So sure, we could, we at OneCare could push and we have for expanded risk corridors in the past, but we do run up against that conceptual barrier with our network of providers. Uh, just a quick point of clarity, um, Chairperson Merman, you asked about the shared savings dynamic in the advance. One of the um, dynamics that's come into play in the past is that we do well relative to the risk corridor. It does have the pad for the advanced shared savings to fund the blueprint on it. But when that shared savings comes in, a significant percentage of those savings are obligated to fund those blueprint expenses, which leaves less for the providers. And this is also compounded by the uh, narrow risk corridors. But just to explain that dynamic a little bit on the upside, it does limit how much shared savings potential there is because a big chunk, that nine and a half million has to come off to fund the blueprint uh, upfront. Um, I also appreciate the staff's recommendation for the maximum trend. I think that makes good sense at this particular time. I want to say that publicly. Uh, risk asymmetry. I, uh, so Chairperson Lange, you asked about uh, the blueprint dynamic. I think the critical, and I'll try to explain this in some um, submissions or, or more of a visual representation perhaps, but the dynamic that's really important is that the refund of advanced shared savings, if this does happen, is before any risk corridor limitations. It's an order of operations factor in settlement. So in the worst case scenario, we have our target, we have the add-on, recognizing that's there. If the healthcare expenditures are such that we reach the bottom of the risk order, the worst case outcome, that's about a 4.6% deviation from target. You have to eat in the whole blueprint, 9 million plus the 3% corridor. In that scenario, we first refund the blueprint advanced shared savings, the nine and a half million, and then have a 3% risk corridor on the whole program. So effectively, the downside exposure is the 3% corridor plus the advanced shared savings. That's the asymmetry that comes into play when you compound it with the dynamic up top with some of the shared savings being consumed for the blueprint. It it becomes very asymmetrical graphically and even on the, the risk uh, maximum risk limit contracts amendments that we have with our providers, it shows kind of that asymmetry in place. Happy to discuss that more. Um, last is around the 2022 base PMPM upon which that trend is applied. Uh, it's actually this slide right on the screen here. 
Uh, first, the 2021 isn't exactly an apples to apples comparison. The one care estimate was pre COVID exclusion. So it's not exactly the same as what was in that rightmost column for CMMI. But really the, the issue I think at play here isn't who's right, who's wrong, good data or bad data. It's being able to reconcile between data sources. We receive a claims feed uh, from Medicare and we receive summary reports from Lewin that corroborate the 867. We have some adjustments in there for QEM, as other estimates, factors that come into play, but the data that we use ties and aligns with our regular reporting throughout the 2022 performance year. It is possible that the actual 2023 population is much healthier and therefore we would expect, or their actual 2022 experience was $820 PM PM, but we don't have any information to tie those together. In other words, there's no data that we have that suggests 2023's population is significantly less cost. And in 2022, we're running very close to target. So we don't think that we're in a situation where the actual spend coming in this year, this calendar year, is materially less than the target we have in 2022, which for reference is about 870 PM PM. So that, that's where the challenge lies. It's not so much in, again, who's right or wrong, but it's being able to connect the data sources so that I have something I can say to our network that shows, here's our actual 2022 experience, here's the 2023 population, here's their morbidity, risk scores, all those factors, and can support the target. So I look forward to continuing to work with uh, Sarah and Lindsay and the rest of the staff to, and, and CMMI directly if possible to help understand why these two data sources are so different, because without that, I'm stuck in a position where I can't recommend the target to our network. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much for um, your comment. We appreciate it. Um, next, we'll turn to public comment, and the first hand raised is Ham Davis. Um, Mr. Davis, please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just two or three comments here. One is, I think it's uh, in my my experience, this is by far the best performance that I've seen of the uh, financial staff of the Green Mountain Care Board. I think this, in my judgment, this is the first time that we've been able to really see in detail the whole landscape. I don't mean to suggest uh, that I have fully grasped it completely, but I can see, I think, that it is all there. Um, and that is a, that is that's a major accomplishment, and and it augurs something uh, for the future as far as the ability of everybody to figure out how to manage this situation. Number two, um, I think that it's very it's critical to remember when we look at this this whole situation, the whole landscape, is that we really have two business. We have really two systems here, not one. We have the UVM network, which is a, which has a completely different business model from the from the uh, from the the other eleven hospitals. The the uh, in effect, the, the UBMMC has such uh, superior cost performance, and the only reason for that is not is that they that they have that the incentives for the, the for their doctors is completely different given the kinds of contracts they have. Whereas the non-network, the uh, the forty percent. Uh, of the system, the other 11 hospitals has a uh, essentially totally fee for service. Um, so they have completely different, they have uh, different business, business models. And I, I, I think it's, uh, so what you make out of it, what you, once, once you, uh, Sarah's people have lay out the entire landscape, then the question really comes down is gonna devolve to not only what one care does with this, but what the Green Mountain Care Board does with the whole situation. Uh, the final thing I would say is that a huge, uh, what I think is one of the biggest difficulties that uh, that I've seen watching this system really since 1980, is that the is that it's very hard, very hard to connect. The kind of abstruse calculations that you go through, the, the, uh, the really talking about how to manage big databases and the ability in big databases to distinguish signals from noise is one of the most complicated problems that we have in public policy, not only in healthcare, but in all 
in all public uh, policy. But what I would assert is, and I would just bet, that the uh, given how complicated this is and how uh, and how it, it just it's just difficult that there is there are, that the real judgment about what's going on in the system do we have confidence uh, somebody said do we have confidence is there, is there confidence in the system it can perform the there's there is the people the real judgments about performance in this system are going to be made by doctors. It's not that the big, big foot administrators don't have any effect or the CEO or the CFO. It is not they don't have any effect. But what the effect they do have is the pressure they put on their own doctors. All the medical care, okay, is decided basically by doctors. Anybody that doesn't get that doesn't get it. And I can, I just, I've, I've been in every one of those hospitals. I've talked to doctors in every one of them. And I can just tell there's no way, no way that a given doctor coming into work uh, on a Tuesday morning or a, what is today, Monday morning, okay, and they've got a room full of patients and they just start working and they hope they get through it by the end of the day. And there's no way anybody can connect these kinds of targets and this and that and percentage of this and percentage of that. Those, those, those. Uh, there's no, there's just simply no connection there. So that what you're really doing is trying to manipulate uh, big complex databases uh, without any effect to get out what the real drivers of the performance are. Thank you. Thank you very much for those insights, um, Mr. Davis. Um, the next hand raised. Uh, Sorry, Member Walsh, did you have your hand raised? I did. I, I just want to point out briefly that <clears throat> the evidence is pretty clear that the highest performing ACOs across the country are those run by healthcare providers. So they are able to do their job taking care of patients and understand these contracts and fulfill them successfully. That's pretty clear. Great. Thank you. Um, and um, Robert Hoffman, Mr. Hoffman, please go ahead. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yes. How are you? Good. Thank you. Good. Uh, I think uh, Member Walsh's final comment is the important one here. And th this distinction between risk aversion and confidence in ability to execute is really just semantics. Providers, uh, given the right tools, we've been shown clearly in other models, provider-led ACOs can make an impact. They need the tools. They deferred to the state's preference for a large uh, centrally controlled ACO and provided them tens of millions of dollars for the uh, infrastructure rather than supporting the individual participants. So the ACO as structured in this state has the horsepower and should be providing the horsepower down to their providers to execute. So confidence is the same as risk appetite. They don't have the risk appetite because as the NORC report showed, less than 10% of them are even using the analytics provided because it's not helpful data. Secondly, as the NORC report suggested, there is a non-existent capacity of clinical information for them to actually execute on the population health efforts that they would normally in another otherwise constituted ACO be able to perform. So it's unsurprising that the risk aversion is there because they're reporting back to their ACO, we don't really feel the ability to affect the change that normally we would. So the, the great part for the executives today who have basically threatened the state to nuke this entire system if they don't get it the way that they want it, their salaries are near irrespective of what the risk is for the network. They take full bonuses in 22 because they satisfied their own internally uh, structured guidelines for how they get their bonuses and their system can continue to defer or decline to take risk with no impact to their bottom line. This is not 
this is not in any way aligned the way that an ACO should be. And I think the public's really looking to this administration, to this board right now. This is an inflection point. Are you going to negotiate with hostage takers who enumerate every last benefit that they provide to the system that unfortunately, because it's too big to fail now, and you can't find another way to disperse these payments out to the communities that desperately need them. If you don't give them what they want, what they've written this morning is they'll threaten to take it all away and not function as the conduit the state needs to disperse those funds. We need to see real leadership here and see pushback on that because you cannot be allowed to become a passive captive agency because something has due to architectural error become too big to fail in the state. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, the next hand raised was um, Michael Del Treco. Mr. Del Treco, how are you? Please go ahead. Good. Hey, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak today. Uh, my slide numbers might be off. I think I was using an earlier slide deck, so uh, apologize if I get some slide numbers wrong, but I wanted to go back to the benchmark component slide for a second. Um, I don't I don't know what slide number that is and then move to I think with a slide 32. Um, I think it was 17 um, Lindsay that Mr. Yeah, 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 that's great. That's I, I you know, um, I think I'll steal maybe a couple of Ham Davis's words and signals and noise. It's so important to get this calculation right. And when I when I heard the discussion around um, targets, um, historical experience, uh, the beneficiaries, the trend and where we are and how we've performed. I landed on slide 32. So if, if we could go there quickly. And no matter whose projection is accurate or not, it seems to me that we have about somewhere in the neighborhood of $40 per member per month in this total cost of care that we could that we could bring into the state of Vermont to help alleviate some of our financial challenges. And that $40, I'm, I'm either taking, you know, if you use 569 or 592 to the min or the, the max of the total cost of care target, you get to about $40. So uh, interestingly enough, on the on the slide where we had the OCV pr projection versus the actual, that's about twenty to forty dollars off too. So again, I don't know who's right or wrong, and if and if our goal is to maximize the federal dollar and this total cost of care uh, methodology and the all payer model, wouldn't we be wanting to hit the six twelve six forty one range as opposed to you know? 600 and 570 and 600 and 585 and and what are the opportunities there forgetting about who's doing the calculation how do we maximize this thing and it's more than just the and it's more than just the uh max trend and i and i do appreciate the uh recommendation to use them the max trend so i'll i'll stop there but but i think maybe you get my what i'm trying to get at and if you don't please please let me know Yes, thank you very much for your comment. Um, Mr. Davis, did you raise your hand again? Do you have another thing? I couldn't tell if it was left up or if you have additional comments. Uh, yeah, yes, th thank you. I'd just like to, um, I'd like to comment about what Mr. Walsh had this, what Mr. Walsh has to say um, about other, other ACOs. Here's what I think is, that it's important to remember, in, in, at least in my judgment, um, is that most of the really a lot there's a lot of ACOs out there that are just doctors, not hospitals, and so it's hard to make a judgment about that. Number two, okay, is that number two is that if you want to find out if you if you look at if you look at the um, if you if you if you look at the uh, actual data that exists uh, in your database, which never gets mentioned here, I would just mention these numbers. The PQI for the for UVMMC is fifty is uh, is uh, is um, five point nine. The PQI for the for the lowest average is is thirteen. Okay, there are at least three hospitals in Vermont that are higher than thirteen. Okay, and the average okay is at least twice UVMMC. The reason for that is that the UVMMC has a completely different business model and a completely different relationship to its doctors. If you take 
the UVMMC, and, and which is 60% of the system, and you apply that 60% of the system, if you extended it to the whole system, then the, then the Vermont ACO, which is a, a broad ACO, it has designated agencies, it has primary care, it has all, it has 13 out of the 14 hospitals, it has a lot of stuff, that that, that the UVM, uh, that, the, that the Vermont performance, if it was based on the 60%, would be the best in the United States. If he doesn't agree with that, show me your numbers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and Dr. Merman, please go ahead. And um, we'll, this will be the last word as we have a, an 11 o'clock meeting. So please, Doctor, go ahead. Oh, oh sorry. I was just wondering if uh, if Lindsay or Sarah could comment on Mike Beltreco's comments regarding slide 32 and, you know, being able to get closer to that all payer model to total cost of care target. Yeah, so this is what was spent. Um, so I, I hear that he's saying that there's headroom, um, but I guess maybe what he's saying is that providers should be doing more to add to the base. Um, that's the only reason way I could see this. I, I going think what he's up. suggesting is is could we increase um, our Medicare um, base rate such that we could get closer to that total cost of care target and bring more federal money into the state. Yeah, yeah. so the reason it's so hard to predict with the bases is a risk protection mechanism that, that Medicare provides to the ACO where anyone who gets the majority of their primary care outside of the network is pulled out. And so that qualified evaluation and management has actually been really beneficial to the ACO. We can talk about changing that so that there's more stability in the benchmark, but it would also add more risk. And so these conversations about risk aversion and, and doing that have been kind of made my head spin a little bit. Um, so that is why we don't know what the base is, but um, unfortunately we can't just add more money to the base. Um, that's, you know, based on historical experience. Um, so that I, I don't see a, a practicable way to do that. Great, thank you. Um, and I see there's additional hands raised, Mr. Davis and Mr. Del Treco. If you could um, submit it in writing, that would be appreciated. We have um, a hard stop for an 11 o'clock meeting we have to get to. Um, and so um, I'll turn it to the board. If there's any old business to come before the board, please speak up. Any new business? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. moved. Seconded. I did. We're not going to be able to vote today. I think we were hoping to get a vote. <laughs> I think we'll vote. We'll vote on Wednesday, Sarah. OK, OK, cool. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the vote carries. Thank you, everyone, for your assistance and um, have a great day. Thank you.